Jesus Listens, the 365-day prayer devotional, now comes in a note-taking edition. This beautiful book includes a leather soft cover and space each day for you to write your reflections, prayers, and thoughts. It makes a perfect gift for anyone who journals and wants to make a record of their walk with God. Look for the Jesus Listens note-taking edition wherever you buy books. That is how people relate. When you talk about your personal experiences and you're vulnerable and you're honest about it. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We all long at some point in life to have that moment of clarity where we know exactly what we're supposed to do and which way we need to go, and everything feels like it clicks into place. Those aha moments can be hard to come by, but we can rely on God to reveal clues to us about where He wants us to be, and often it's in those little details that we ourselves might not even notice. Taking time to be still, praying, and watching for those signs that He's working goes a long way to making the most out of the short time we have here on Earth. When she was a little girl, Tamara Morey Housley knew what she wanted to be, an actress, and with the support of her family, she dove in headfirst. But navigating a life in the spotlight at such a young age presented a unique set of difficulties. Mike Kinney was miraculously rescued from a tragic car accident, which led him to consider, who am I and where do I go from here? After healing from the accident, Mike came to realize that God was organizing the details for him to lead others to see what God has for them and help them find their own aha moments in life. Let's begin with Tamara's story. My name is Tamara Mori Housley, and I am an entertainer. I was very fortunate to have an amazing childhood. We had a very supportive and loving upbringing. Mom and dad were in the army, so we did travel a lot. And no, we weren't mega rich. <laughs> we were army brats, but and we lived on um, different bases, certain cities, government housing. But my mom and dad, uh, the way they did it, you know, we were very well taken care of. We had wonderful neighborhoods. I grew up in Killeen, Texas, Copper's Cove, Texas, Mililani, Hawaii, uh, Oahu. And for the most part, my life up until I would say um, 11 was picture perfect. We were so, so very blessed. Whenever we had a need or desire to want to do something, meaning, hey, we want to dance or we want to take gymnastics. Mommy, I, I love those little barrettes that the girls have in their hair now. My mom and dad made a way, and I was so grateful for that. They inspired me to do the exact same. That It doesn't mean that they weren't working and working hard. They worked long hours. They, I remember having to get up like it. 5 30 6 a.m to get our hair done and dressed for school and then they would drop us off at the babysitter and then we would walk to school like it was back in the day i can remember going to church with my mom every sunday like from the age of five and uh, we went to a church called city of refuge in hawaii and I remember just seeing the joy in my mom's face. She sang in the choir, so we used to also go to the practices. And I remember one day the pastor said, do you want to know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for yourself? Come on up here and accept the Lord. Accept Jesus into your heart. I literally felt kind of like a, it was like a gentle pulling to just raise my hand and walk up there and accept Jesus into my life. I was eight years old. That night, I can still remember, we had bunk beds. In my bunk bed, just talking to God at eight. <laughs> Saying, you know, I, I wanna know you. I wanna know why I'm here. And to have those thoughts at such a young age, 
I mean, and they were strong. I just felt this tugging. I think that's the word instead of pulling, like this tug to just know God more. And I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid to talk to him, but I always say, my relationship with God, you know, I had a children's Bible, so I used to always read that, and I loved Sunday school. Like, I loved it. We had great Sunday school teachers. So I learned about Jesus and God and the Bible at a very young age. I can remember after school, around like three o'clock, we would be at home. My mom would, um, she'd pick us up. And I don't know if they if the stories were on the weekends. I think I remember one was even on like Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. But you know, like days of our lives, as the world turns, all those uh, daytime soap operas. I used to love to watch. I can remember at a very young age being like, wow, their hair is coiffed and their makeup is done just to go to the corner store. Or, or they're just hanging out in their house and they look like that. This looks like fun. And I remember telling my mom that I wanted to do something like that. And right away, being the involved mother she is, she did her research and she realized that there's community plays in Texas. Uh, We were in Texas at this time. There's an agent. uh, You could do little local commercials. And that's what we did. So I started actually in a community play. I did it first. My sister was like, I don't know if I want to do this. So I was kind of like the guinea pig. I absolutely loved it. I was nine. And at nine years old, I felt like I found my calling. I told my mom, I said, Mom, I want to act. I want to dance. I definitely want to. I think I found my place. And that was at nine. And then two years later, we moved to Los Angeles because my mom did more and more research of, you know, how to be successful in the entertainment field. And our Texas agent said, well, you know, there's a very small market here, (laughs) but if you want to, you know, make it big or, you know, want to make it uh, on a larger scale, you would have to move to Los Angeles or New York. And uh, we made a deal with my mom because she wanted to make sure it was something for us and for her because she would have to quit her job and for her to become our manager. We went out to Los Angeles for a month. That was the deal. If we booked a commercial within a month or booked something, it was for us. And we did. We booked a Chrysler commercial, my sister and I. Hollywood is, you know, on its own little island. I feel that affects the world. Yes, I auditioned for things in Texas and I did pageants, but for the first time I experienced true rejection. And when you're 11, you know, you're thinking, okay, if I do A, B, C, and D, if I give my all in this audition, I study my lines, I do my best, well, you're gonna get the part. But you know, I learned the hard way that that's not how it works. Not only are you auditioning, you're auditioning against thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have been doing this for thousands and thousands, well, it felt like thousands and thousands of years. (laughs) I was just this fledgling young actress coming in, you know, just bright-eyed, hopeful, and excited, and rightfully so, but we learned at a very young age how, I don't want to say brutal the business can be, but challenging. We went through a lot, you know, you're 11 and dealing with rejection and and what that feels like and being doubtful, questioning yourself. Did I make the right decision? But I love what I do. Am I good enough? Those questions started to seep in. Going, you know, um, to school and then to junior high, experiencing your preteen years, which can be challenging in and of itself, but then add you know, trying to break it into Hollywood at the same time. A child learns reasoning at 11 years old. So we were in the thick of it. So that's when we started learning, you know, like, okay, why is this happening? And to be frank, I'm 44 years old and I just learned to grasp the process of auditioning and not taking it personal. 
<laughs> just being able to control what you can control, which is make sure you study, make sure you know your motivation, you know your lines, you perfect your craft, you never give up on that. But ultimately, once you send that tape in and, and you go in and you give it your all, the only thing you're in control of is, is, is your performance. Other than that, it's in the hands of the producers, the directors, and if it's for you, it's for you. You know, I always say preparation plus opportunity equals success. So as long as you're prepared and you're doing what you need to do, the right opportunity will come along and the right role will come along. I'm actually at the point right now where I don't want what's not for me. I don't because if it's not, it's what I've learned through experience. There's no peace. It's it feels like you're always, you know, swimming upstream. One can argue that it's not as successful. And that's in every aspect of my life. Friendships, relationships, marriage, roles, opportunities. I want what's for me. I'm not trying to be what's not me because you lose yourself. Once you lose your identity, you're frazzled, you're confused all the time. And life is short. We only have a certain amount of, you know, and that's with time on our side, a certain, you know, amount of years. And I want to live it peacefully and joyfully. It wasn't until I feel like I was 16, 14 actually, 14, 15, 16, was when we got Sister, Sister. And that's when I started to go through the feelings of anxiety, fear, excitement, gratefulness, thanking God for finally achieving, you know, my my dream. But with your dreams and your goals, it doesn't stop there. You've got to go on to the next lesson, which is I used to struggle with the spirit of perfection. I just, I thought that if I was perfect, all the problems would go away. All my insecurities would go away. And, you know, later I found out it was actually, <laughs> the more you think like that, the more you're imprisoned because the Lord loves us without perfection. You know, I mean, when you love someone, yes, you want to do right by them. And obviously I know that the word of God you know, is a gift to us that gives us the keys to living a joyful and, and I say joyful because joy comes no matter what is happening in your life. You know that God is in the midst of it, right? But yeah, at that age, I, I had to learn that, you know, the pressure of staying on top, being, you know, a successful show, then realizing you're canceled. Your show's canceled. Your dreams are just kind of whoop, and now you got to pick up and move on. I felt this tugging to share my story because I've learned the power of one's voice being on the reel. I've learned that if you keep all of your lessons and your life experiences to yourself, no one is going to learn. Like I've learned from other people's experiences. I was always self-aware. Uh, and there were some, you know, situations that I had to go through more than once, but uh, I was aware. Being a mom and being a working mom, of course, there's going to be situations in your life where you might not do what you set out to do. But I have discovered that when I make a point to tell myself, I need to read and pray. I need to read the word, meditate on the word, and pray daily. I find myself doing that more than not doing it. So what I do is I wake up earlier than everyone else, or if my husband or my kids wake up before me, I say, mommy just needs some time. Because I've realized that prayer and reading the word, it isn't something I want to do. It's something I need to do. It's a necessity to protect my peace, my spirit, and my mind daily. I need to do it. Otherwise, I find myself kind of 
easily tempted. And what I mean by tempted, I find myself holding this thought longer than I should, whether it's an insecurity, an anxiety, whatever. (laughs) I've learned that if I don't feed my soul with the word of God and talk to God daily, it's easy for me to kind of lose my stepping. I have realized that God cares about the smallest details in our life. And I've also learned through heartbreak and, you know, death in the family, just life's lessons that God is in Jesus. Your relationship with Jesus is the only thing that can kind of get me over the hump. And what I mean by that is... With every decision that I make, and yes, I mean, <laughs> Ezekiel, I think it's 34, 11 through 16, talks about how we all stray, you know? I mean, we're not perfect, but how we serve a God that's going to always rescue us, and He's going to be our shepherd. We're like the sheep. And I've learned that in my life, whenever I feel like I'm struggling, lost, uncertain, I go to the Word. I go to the Word of God, and there I find my answers. The moment I give it to God, I know that even if I don't understand what's happening, the Lord understands I've learned to just let go and give it to God and know that He will give me the peace and most important, I always say, the warmth of his love, because love heals. It's a balm, no matter what you're going through, whether it's fear, heartbreak, grief, the warmth of God's love, knowing that he loves us and he cares for us, despite, you know, our circumstances or whatever we're going through, always uplifts me. And then I have learned throughout my life to understand and to learn the difference between God's voice and my voice and, uh, you know, and, and the tugging of the Holy Spirit. And the way I can easily decipher the two is that God's word, God's voice are never going to be different, right? God's word is God's word, and it's true. To learn more about Tamira and to keep up with her recent work, follow her on social media, or you can find her memoir, You Should Sit Down for This, at your favorite retailer. Stay tuned to Mike Kinney's story after a brief message. Jesus Listens, the best-selling 365-day daily prayer devotional from Sarah Young, is now available for children. This book invites your children and you into an ongoing conversation with God, growing a meaningful prayer life and closer relationship with Him. Kids will learn how to pray honest prayers and know that Jesus is always listening to them. This book will equip parents who want to teach their kids how to pray and talk to God reassure their children that God is always with them, and help their kids to read Bible verses each day. This inspirational book for kids ages 8 to 12 makes a perfect gift for Christmas, birthdays, graduation celebrations, back to school, baptisms, Sunday school awards, or first communions. Jesus Listens, 365 Prayers for Kids is a wonderful tool to help your children read scripture and pray every day of the year. Available wherever books are sold. When he was just 17 years old, Mike Kinney and his friend were driving on a country road when Mike's truck hit a pole, trapping him underneath the dashboard. Thanks to the courage of his friend and the compassion of a passerby, Kinney was miraculously saved from the fiery crash. As he recovered, he began to question what he was supposed to be doing in life. And as he began to see God's plan unfold, he was excited to share the details of his journey in the hopes of inspiring others to wait to see what amazing things God might have in store for their lives too. 
I grew up in a Christian home and uh, two siblings, my brother John and my sister Rachel. You know, every, every boy looks up to their father and wants to have the best relationship in the world with their father and I was no different. Dad was super dad. He was my soccer coach and was involved in everything that he possibly could be. He was also very involved in these different roles at church and being an elder. And then he ran a dental practice here on the north side of town. So we were just constantly in touch with different families and people. And I think as a, as a young boy, just trying to find my place, um, my dad, because of just his position and how much I respected him and looked up to him. I think I was constantly trying to figure out what my purpose could be and, you know, maybe if I could measure up, but I kind of questioned in my mind if I uh, had what it takes, I guess, to grow up and be like my dad. And so the, the way that I really was feeling validated and felt like, man, I can do this was uh, with singing. And that's because from a young age, I was given some opportunities. I started leading worship in a high school for my church youth group and had seen my youth pastor lead others into the Lord's presence. And I thought, man, that is something I want to do. It was like the perfect match. It was, you know, mixing music with my faith and I just couldn't imagine anything better than that. And it was real, it was genuine. I could see my youth pastor's heart as he led others in worship. And I thought, I wanna be just like that. I wanna do that. And so I asked him probably my freshman year if I could join the worship team. And I had no idea how to play guitar. I just knew I could sing. And he said, you know, well, let's, I'll let you sing for a little while and then we'll, we'll try to work you in on the guitar. And then by my junior year, he had turned the whole weekend service over to me uh, to lead. You know, it was two or three hundred of my peers each week, and it was really the highlight of my week. It was kind of like I was on this journey to try to figure out what my purpose, what my calling could be. And I felt like I had really big shoes to fill when it came to looking up to my dad. It was the second day of my senior year in high school, and I had all these things going for me, I thought, and all these exciting possibilities out in front of me. And then this car accident happens and it's kind of like everything, everything was gonna look different. I was wedged underneath this dashboard. The guy that pulled me out of this burning truck, his name's Matt Blickendorf. Matt tried to pull on me for five or six minutes and couldn't get me out. And he's calling on, the name of Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, I need you. Help me. Help me. I can't do this alone. And we were on this dark country road and this guy's driving down the country road. And so Matt leaves me hanging from the truck, runs to the road and the guy zooms past him, doesn't even stop. And so Matt runs back to the truck. He's still shouting to the Lord, I need your help. And And this guy had just moved further away from the truck because there was gas cans all over the road and he probably wanted to get away from the truck. It looked uh, pretty bad. So he comes running through these bushes and they both end up pulling me out. I woke up in the hospital and you gotta imagine being in this moment where your life is completely stopped and everything that you dreamed of is just gonna go away. At least it seems like you may not walk again. I burned uh, about 30% of my body, had to recover from this severe brain injury and didn't know if I'd walk again. Those are like, you know, things that change your life. And then it was like, well, now what am I supposed to do? You know, and now who am I? And, And where do I go from here? The guy that saved my life and pulled me out of this burning truck His mom was the owner of a Christian bookstore. And so back then we didn't have the internet to help get the word out, but she did have email lists and, uh, and sent out a thing called picks for Kenny. And it was trying to encourage people to send guitar picks to the hospital. Tom Griswold, as part of Bob and Tom, his son went to a local private school and 
one of the administrators is a family friend. And so she said, hey, have you heard about this car accident that just happened recently? We're doing this thing called Picks for Kenny. Would you mind talking about it on air? And they did. And guitar picks start coming from all over the nation. And I guess one of the people on Bob and Tom's team also reached out to The Who and and their management team, uh, Pete Townsend, and said, hey, do you think Pete would be willing to send Mike a guitar pick? And he said, well, how about I send him a guitar? And so he sent me this Gibson acoustic guitar and he signed the body of it in big letters. I'm looking at it right now. It says, to Mike, this is the Phoenix, Pete Townsend. And of course, the implications, the meaning of the Phoenix, I understood that and what it meant to rise from the ashes. To me, it it meant that I had a second chance and that the Lord would use my story. God's gonna use your story and you're gonna be able to share about your faith because of this story and because of what's happened to you. You're gonna have a message that you'll be able to share at some point in, you know, in your journey. And so that's why the Pete Townsend, the Phoenix guitar means so much to me. I had a dream about a year after my car accident and it was on my birthday that I had this dream. I woke up at, you know, one in the morning and knew I had dreamt something that I had never seen before or heard of before. Well, around the time of the car accident, maybe in the the year or two prior, you were seeing a lot of people start to use a thing called a shortcut capo, um, which hit strings numbers two, three, and four. And there's six strings on a guitar. The shortcut capo would hit strings two, three, and four. And what it allowed you to do is you could either play with just the shortcut capo, or you could put a full capo on, let's say the second fret, and the shortcut capo on the fourth fret. And what that would do is it would allow you to play one and two finger chord positions. So instead of, you know, think of, if you're not a musician, think of how complicated it might be to try to play a chord with, uh, you know, three, four or five fingers and uh, memorize those shapes and remember them. Well, with the shortcut capo, you could play one or two finger chord positions, really sound like a pro. And the reason it was, it's so significant to me and my story is that uh, the one I dreamed about was very similar to a full capo, only it would allow you to push down like a push pin above each of the six strings. So like kind of like a retractable pin with a foot on it, you could click on and click off and you could individually select which strings, you know, on that particular, you know, fret that you wanted to push down. And what I figured out was it, it opened up all kinds of new possibilities that couldn't have been possible before. And if you put a capo behind it, now there's like tens and thousands of possibilities of different, and basically makes a guitar like a piano um, because you have different octaves uh, to work with. So now there's, there's new overtones and things that, again, just weren't possible before. You know, looking back now, it's a little clearer to see, but, um, it was because of my need that this dream happened, I believe. The lead guitarist in our band who knows every instrument, knows the guitar like the back of his hand, understands everything that has to do with theory. He said, you know, why don't you just learn how to play it without the capos? Well, see, I play music by ear. Uh, There's musicians out there that can read sheet music. And I tried as a kid, I took piano lessons but it just was never my strong suit, but I can hear music. I play a note that doesn't sound right. And I know when I play something that, oh, that feels right. You know, the accident had messed with some areas of my brain that could affect motor skills. And they didn't know if I'd be able to play music again because the area of my brain that was impacted by the accident should have affected my ability to play music. There was this need and I feel like the Lord gave me this dream. It was a gift that he gave me and it became a symbol of hope over the next 18 plus years. You know, what's really cool is Pete Townsend's birthday is May 19th. I thought that was special over the years because my birthday is May 20th, his is May 19th. So I have the dream, uh, you know, May 19th going into May 20th. So at like one in the morning on May 20th and 
call me crazy, but I always felt like the Lord could somehow use this to to get the story back to Pete Townsend somehow, some way, you know, um, because Pete Townsend's a celebrity that I, apparently everybody knows, but I didn't know anything about him. And, you know, God loves him too. And he has a story too. And um, and the Lord wants him to know that, that God loves loves him. And so, you know, God uses all of us. And that's been part of, you know, the anthem of my story is that you're never too broken to be used by God. We are all broken in some way, or we've experienced hard times, or we've gone through trauma, and everybody can relate with that. And so to know that Jesus is with us in those moments is something that everyone hopes for and they want to believe. And I I think that when they hear my story, it helps them maybe change their perspective or take a second look at those traumatic events that took place in their life and just ask God where, where he was and where is he now? He's continued to show me his presence and he's continued to put people in my life that have helped me find healing, you know, from trauma. And I've had to kind of keep my eyes open and looking for those moments. But as I looked back, it was so clear that he's been at work in my life. And, you know, it was the moment that I shared my story with a men's retreat at my church a few years ago that I I gave a talk that was called that were designed for God's purpose. And I think God has a sense of humor because it was like on that weekend and giving, sharing my talk that I had another vision uh, that was kind of completely different from the capo vision, but it was a vision of me with Matt in the field, the night of the accident. And Matt had one hand on me and the other hand lifted to the sky. And I was kneeling down next to him. And it was like the Lord said, Mike, this is why you're here. This is your purpose and uh, is to go help people share your story, share your faith with people that are lost and are hurting and broken and need to know that I'm with them. Jesus listens, July 31st. My Savior God, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. I know that you use difficult times to strengthen me spiritually. Just as gold is refined by fire, so my faith is refined by trials to prove that it is genuine. As I cling to you in the midst of adversity, my faith grows stronger and I find comfort in you. When I endure trials and dependence on you, I gain confidence that I can cope with future hardships. More and more, I'm able to trust that you will always help me in my time of need. Your hand is not only powerful, but righteous. I love the assurance you give me in your word. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In your powerful name, Jesus' name, amen. To learn more about Mike Kinney and his story, check out his book, Out of the Fire, How an Angel and a Stranger Intervened to Save a Life. If you'd like to hear more stories about purpose during times of uncertainty, check out our interview with Inky Johnson. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we'll hear from fitness professional and pastor Andy Dooley, who shares how he found his unique path through the world and how he and his family are prioritizing their relationships with God, both together and on their own. That's what I'm praying for right now is this continued direction and guidance. What is to, you know, to keep my vision clear so that I know what my no is and what my yeses are and to continually be able to provide for my family. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Jesus Calling Book, 
on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.